Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to continue our read through of this great book, History of World Map by Map. I was filming another video and my voice started to go out. It's just something that's kind of always happened after I talk too much. Um, and if you've seen the last video, which you guys really seem to love as much as I loved making it, um, I was dealing with COVID while I was filming that. I'm much better now, but of course my throat is still dealing with the repercussions, so I'm going to be speaking probably a little more softer than usual, but whatever. It's an ASMR video, that's the point, right? So let's explore some more of this amazing book going to start off by looking at, you can't see, the first cities. Let's take a look at these maps. And again, I haven't looked at these beforehand. I haven't read any of this, so sorry if there's any um, flubs in my speech or whatever, but um, I like exploring this with you guys. We're going to start off with pre-dynastic Egypt from 4000 BCE to 3050 BCE. From 4000 BCE, Egyptian cities such as Heliopolis, Memphis, and Abydos grew into key trading centers, importing metals and building stones from Nubia. They also traded with Mesopotamian cities, acquiring valuable materials such as lapis lazuli, which has its origin in the Indus Valley. By 3500 BCE, Nekin which is later named Hierocompolis, Hierocompolis, was already a large city with the Egypt's oldest known temples housing royal tombs. So we can see if I can show the map here. Some of the ancient royal tombs here. Which we're going to read all the little captions after we read the boxes. Also, there's a storm brewing outside. It's going to hit in a few hours, so... You might hear my neighbor's wind chime rolling around in the background. I think it's kind of nice. Next, we have trade with Mesopotamia from 4000 to 250 BCE. By 4000 BCE, many city-states had emerged in Mesopotamia. Cities such as Kish, Uruk, and Ur traded local goods to the Mediterranean and also formed trade links with the Indus region source of luxury goods, such as carnelian beads and lapis lazuli. Religion played a key societal role. Temples redistributed surplus food and craft products offered in the name of gods as rations, or traded them for raw materials. So here in the ziggurat shape, you can see the major temples of Mesopotamia, which you can see right there. Here, all over this area. You kind of think Mesopotamia is just being right here, but it really spread out into the Arabian Peninsula, didn't it? It's kind of neat. Next, we have the Akkadian Empire from 2300 to 2200 BCE. As the Mesopotamian cities continued to flourish, powerful leaders sought control over the region. The first was Sargon. As a young man, Sargon served the king of Kish, but later rebelled and overthrew the Sumerian ruler. He renamed the city-state Akkad and built it into a military power before conquering the cities of southern Mesopotamia and lands to the northwest as far as Biblos. See, the purple is Sumer, and the red is the Akkadian Empire. So here, you can see Sumer, here, it's just this, you can see there's Rook, on the other, there's Eridu, so on, but then the Akkadian Empire spread out all this way into Anatolia, and around the rivers here, and around the Persian Gulf. Big empire in the day, right? Conquering the land here, the Mediterranean coast. Pretty big at the time. The first
first real empire. Next we have the cities of the Indus from 2600 to 1500 BCE. Ruins of cities such as Harappa and Mohenjo-daro show planned street layouts and sophisticated water supply and drainage systems. These cities produced fine metalwork and developed new techniques in handicraft. From around 2500 BCE, they traded widely, dispatching their goods with seals carved from inscriptions. These branding objects have been found throughout Mesopotamia, revealing how widely the Indus people traded. So we can find um, inscription relics here, and chlorite vessels. What is chlorite vessels? I, I guess just artifacts, right? So we can find these all throughout. This is the Indus Valley here, but they've been found all throughout this area. All sorts of different artifacts, right? All throughout Mesopotamia and a bunch in here. And then the inscriptions have been found in this part of Mesopotamia, way down here near Til Moon also. Well, it's on an island, but close to Til Moon. <laughs> and up here in Mesopotamia by Mar. Pretty neat how far these artifacts spread during their trading rounds, right? And let me see if I can get this box in frame. Yes. Yeah. Okay, last we have the Carnelian Trade from 2350 to 1800 BCE. A precious stone known as Carnelian was valued second to lapis lazuli, both in Mesopotamian and in Harappan society. Carnelian was sourced in and around the Indus Valley and was mostly crafted into beads and amulets. From around 2350 BCE, Indus Valley merchants who traded in carnelian jewelry established links with Mesopotamian cities. So we can see some sites that had carnelian beads. There goes my voice. <laughs> carnelian beads in this shape of a little necklace. You can see one just outside the Indus Valley here. Lots up here by the Caspian Sea. I know they loved their lapis, which, of course, because it's a beautiful stone, but they also loved their carnelian. How interesting. Let's go through all the little boxes here. Let me get Egypt and Nubia in here. It says, here in circa 2000 BCE, Egyptian cities trade with Nubia, importing luxury goods such as gold, copper, ebony, and incense. And up here in higher, higher copper. Circa 3100 BCE, Hierakopolis is the most likely capital after Lower and Upper Egypt are unified under King Normer. What else do we have? Let's go to Mesopotamia. Up here, circa 3000 BCE, it's called Ashur, Ashuna. Let me move closer. Ashuna. Never heard that sign. Ashnuna holds a strategic position, controlling trade between Mesopotamia and the northeastern region. The up here in Uruk. Circa 2700 BCE, Uruk's population reaches about 50,000. And up here in Ur, circa 2040 BCE, the ziggurat of Ur is built by King Urnamu. Let's look at these. I assume these are trade routes, right? Circa 3000 BCE. Yep. Trade routes are established across the Iranian plateau, linking Mesopotamia with the Indus Valley. What else do we have up here? Circa 2000 BCE, with its lapis lazuli mines. What's it say? It says. 
can't see the, the black font on the blue. Sure to guy. Ooh, that's a cool name. Sure to guy becomes a key trading colony of the Indus civilization. Lots of little ancient cities I've never heard of on this page. Pir Mahendradar, I've definitely heard of that one. Circa 2600 BCE. Construction of the city of Mahendradar um, reflects sophisticated civil engineering and urban planning. That's very true. And then way over here, circa 3000 BCE, it says, um, Lo it's so hard to see. Lo 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 oh, that's the name of the town. Lothal bead makers develop advanced methods to work with carnelian. That's cool. And way down here, you can see the head of King Sargon. It says, unearthed from the ancient ruins of Nineveh. This bronze head sculptor is thought to be King Sargon of Akkad. I usually see the statue like face on and the other half is kind of eroded away. So neat to see it from this angle where it's best preserved. King Sargon. Let's see what we have next. Egypt of the Pharaohs. This is two different maps. So let me try to get these in. First we have the Old Kingdom. 2700 to 2180 BCE. By 2700 BCE, a succession of rulers had centralized their power in Egypt and governed from the capital Memphis. The grand pyramids built during this era were symbolic of their power. The valley prospered as merchants traveled into the western desert and along the Red Sea coast to ply their trade. However, in 2180 BCE, a period of low flood and the ensuing famine resulted in Egypt splitting into two realms, Upper and Lower Egypt. So we can see... Sorry for the wobbles, by the way. I figured out it's my desk that's wobbling, not the, the camera holder or anything. The whole desk wobbles if I just <laughs> shift slightly like that. So I have to fix that somehow, but moving on. The region of control you can see is all the screen following the Nile River. The kingdom capital is a green square, so right here at Thebes. And the pyramids are obviously green pyramid shapes. Let's see if I can find any. There's one right there. Oh, I see they're tiny. They're all up in here. There's Giza. Oh, I can hear the wind blowing outside. So yeah, just in this valley, right? It looks like in other places. That must be Normers, the first pyramid, I assume. Maybe it'll say somewhere on here. And then the trade routes are the green arrows at this time, so we can see them trading out to the various oases out here. Very cool. Let's see what happens during the Middle Kingdom. Let me slide this over this way. From 2040 to 1786 BCE, by 2040 BCE, the rulers of Thebes had grown increasingly powerful and became rulers of all of Egypt. Their domain was slightly larger than that of the Old Kingdom, and their merchants traveled farther to establish new trade links. In 1640 BCE, Pharaonic rule ended for just over a century when the Hyksos people from the Levant conquered. So additional regions of control are these orange spots you see here. Here, these became part of Middle Egypt. And down here, they expanded a bit down the river. The temples are little orange temples. Let's see. You can see them up here. Little orange temples. And over here. do we have? Uh, forts are these squares here. These are ancient forts, probably defending from the Nubians, but the real threat came from the Hyksos up here, right? Um, the Nubian chieftains are, let's 
see. He did orange. Oh, I see. So this is the Nubian chieftains here. And then the orange arrows are the trade routes during this time. Lots of them, right? Made little road networks all over the place. Even up here, too. Is that Biblos or? Yeah, Biblos. I guess it wasn't called Biblos at the time. Then down here into the Red Sea as well. So we know these little boxes because I see other shapes that are delineated in the thing. Let's see over here in 2100 BCE, large forts are built to assert power over Nubia after the region is conquered. I called it. Let's see up here in 2550 BCE, pharaonic power makes first contact with oasis settlements such as Baharia. I guess the little trees here mean oases, right? 2160 BCE Hat Nenesu, capital of Lower Egypt, until 2025 BCE. Today is usually known by its Greek name of Heracleopolis. And let's see here. Oh, these are the pyramids. 2580 to 2560 BCE. Egypt's Great Pyramids built in Giza. And, oh, let's see, where are we pointing? The trade route? Oh, the Hyksos. 1640 BCE, the Hyksos people conquer Lower Egypt with horse drawn chariots. They just went boom right to Thebes. So. There's this little box they appear. Old and Middle Kingdoms, ancient Egypt was the world's first large centrally ruled state. Agriculture flourished in the Nile Valley's fertile soil, while trade yielded materials for building marvels like the pyramids. Awesome. Then let's look at the New Kingdom, which you can see, compared to the Old and Middle, are absolutely massive. <laughs> see what it says. The New Kingdom, 7, 1570 to 1085 BCE. Amos of Thebes laid the foundations for the New Kingdom and took power after expelling the Hyksos from Lower Egypt in 1532 BCE. Under later pharaohs, Egypt expanded its territory across the Mediterranean and reached the Fourth Cataract to the south. Trade increased, and renewed prosperity allowed the rulers to construct enormous temples. So the dark purple pinkish magenta is the region of control. You can see they expanded further south and all up in this region. And then the area, the region of contact is the rest of the magenta. You can see Greece up there, all along the coast here, and then way, way down here. And way up here. See the kingdom capital is this purple square. It's right here, Thebes. The temples are the little pink side. You can't see. Let me, there we go. Temples all throughout. Lots of new temples built at this time. All around the Nile River. There we go. And up here, the Sinai Peninsula too. Ooh, I hear that wind campaign against the Hyksos is this big purple arrow. So they went up here and fought the Hyksos. And then the little arrows are their trade routes going all over to the Red Sea, up across the Mediterranean, up over here to Greece, up here to Sicily, or Crete, I mean, that's Crete. <laughs> and the Hyksos siege, you can see it's this shape here. Where's the Hyksos siege right here? They fought back against the Hyksos and reclaimed their empire, basically. Let's see, number four, the reign of Akhenaten, 1353 to 1336 BCE. I'm gonna, here, let me adjust this so I'm not like leaning beneath the microphone here. I'm gonna slide this forward a little. There we go, so I can actually 
1351 BCE, Amenhotep IV came to the throne. He changed his name to Akhenaten in honor of the sun god Aten, built a new capital named after himself, and declared that Aten was the only god. His principal queen, Nefertiti, was a powerful influence during his reign. Later, pharaohs destroyed Akhenaten's statues and removed his name from king lists. So we can see Am Amarna is the blue star here. That was the capital during Akhenaten's reign. He's kind of eccentric, right? He's really passionate about his religion. And last, we have the reign of Ramses II, 1295 to 1213 BCE. In the 14th century BCE, Egypt lost some of its territory to Canaan in Canaan to the Hittites of Anatolia leading to decades of tension and sometimes warfare between the two peoples. The formidable ruler Ramses II challenged Hittite power at the Battle of Kadesh, preventing further Hittite advances. So we can see battles are up here, and the Levant up here against, let's see, and that's Kadesh right there, the big battle. And the Hittite Empire was up here. Oop, you can't see. The Hittite Empire was all up here. So the big battle right on the borders with the Egyptian and Hittite Empires, which Ramses was uh, victorious. Let's read the little box. Let me see if I can get it in frame. All right. New Kingdom. The expulsion of the Hyksos led to the reunification of Egypt ushering in the new kingdom in 1530 BCE. This was the third great era of Egyptian culture, a period of economic prosperity and cultural achievements in the region. And over here is the iconic Queen Nefertiti. The bust of Nefertiti, the great royal wife of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten, is believed to have been crafted by the sculptor Tadmos, circa 1345. See what's happening on this map up here 1264 to 1244 BCE Abu Simbel temple is built to commemorate Ramses's victory at the Battle of Kadesh he loved to make statues of himself a little narcissistic but he was the pharaoh so that's how that works 1570 to 1069 BCE up here Karna the vast complex at Karnak in Thebes is expanded with temples to deities such as Amun-Ra and Mut. What else do we have? This trade route from Byblos to Mycenae, 1475 to 1425 BCE. During Tutmos III's rule, Egyptian ships sail across the Mediterranean to Greece and Anatolia. Oh yeah. And then up here at the battle, 1285 BCE, Ramses II and his troops route, 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 what is that word, R-O-U-T, route the Hittites after being ambushed. Okay, I've never seen that word in my life, but I guess it makes sense. Next map, we're going to look at maps of the first ever writing. Where do we start? Way down here. Let me get it in frame. I'll have to tilt the book a little. There we go. I'm sorry for the weird angles. That's the best I can do. <laughs> this book's just too big. So I'll just read it to you. It says pictographs to cuneiform, 3400 BCE to 100 CE. Ooh, the first time we're in the common era. Oh, I've got it in frame. There we go. Writing was first devised in Sumer. Sumerian scribes first used pictographs, which are picture-like symbols, but simplified these into wedge-shaped marks. These marks give the technique its name, which comes from the Latin cuneus, a wedge. From Sumerian cities such as Uruk, cuneiform spread across Mesopotamia, and peoples from the Hittites in Turkey to the Persians in Iran used it to write their languages. So, this cuneiform is used in the blue area here, down 
here and zoom here. And then it's spread along the blue arrows up here, over there, up here. Very useful system, right? So yeah, of course it's spread. But next we have the Egyptian hieroglyphs, 3200 BC to 400 CE. The Egyptians developed their hieroglyphs toward the end of the 4th millennium BCE. Hieroglyphs are pictorial symbols representing ideas, syllables, or sounds. People used them mainly for carved temple inscriptions. Hieroglyphs fell out of use after the temples to the Egyptian gods closed in the 4th century CE. But this was not before the idea of hieroglyphic writing seems to have passed to Crete and Anatolia. So here you can see the Egyptian empire here where hieroglyphs were used. They spread over to Crete, and up to Anatolia, and even over here to Ugarit. Let's see what's next. The first alphabets. 1500 to 1050 BCE. The earliest alphabet a system of symbols denoting all language sounds, both consonants and vowels, can be traced to circa 1500 BCE. And what is known as Proto-Canaanite or Proto-Sinatic. Some experts suspect it developed from a subset of Egyptian hieroglyphs. The people who used it passed the idea on to the Phoenicians, who had developed it into their own alphabet by 1050 BCE. Being maritime traders, they took their alphabet around the Mediterranean. So here's where you can see the Proto-Canaanite and Phoenician alphabets began. And um, I, I remember it's interesting because the older writings did not denote vowels. They only had consonants. So this was not just the first alphabet, but the first time vowels were written down, I believe. Maybe the Hindus people. We we can't translate the Hindus language. But they used in like Harappa and Mandadaro, so maybe they did use vowels, but not these languages. Then we move on to the Western alphabets, 1050 BCE to 250 CE. The peoples who traded with the Phoenicians, such as the Greeks and Etruscans, adapted the Phoenician alphabet for their own languages. The Roman alphabet, now used all over the world, derives from the script of the Etruscans. Exactly how the alphabet reached Northern Europe, or it might have triggered the development of runic alphabets, remains unknown. So this alphabet spread over here. into the mainland here, over to Italy, and then up into Europe, all over the place, even up through Gaul to Britain. So the Phoenician-influenced alphabet was used here in ancient Greece, and up here in ancient Rome, and the runic alphabets were used. a few more boxes because we're not done yet with the writing. We also have Chinese characters from 1200 BCE to 200, 220 CE. From the late Shang Dynasty, various scripts evolved in China. They were all um, logographic, meaning the complex symbols called characters denoted words or morphemes, which is the smallest unit of language that conveys meaning rather than sounds. By the Han Dynasty, certain standard scripts had developed, one of which is the unsimplified script still in use outside the People's Republic. So Chinese script was used all throughout here, the ancient Chinese dynasties, and then spread to the Korean Peninsula, the Japanese islands, and out this way. Then we have the Indian scripts from 268 BCE to 400 CE. South Asia has a profusion of syllabic scripts, all descended from Brahmi, which dates back to at least to Ashoka's rule, 
but whose origins are obscure. Brahmi may have developed indigenously or been adapted from alphabets such as Aramaic from Western Asia. What is certain is that Indian writing has no known link with the mysterious and undeciphered script of the long-lost Indus Valley Civilization. So the Indus Valley script is used all throughout here. And um, like I said, it's we can't translate them. But then the influence of Brahmi spread here to the Indian subcontinent and all the way toward Mesopotamia. Since they were like trading and stuff, right? I can't wait to read all these little boxes. I'm sure there's some cool info in there. But first we're going to look at Never to be Forgotten. Hieroglyphs were painstaking to write and were not used for everyday purposes. They were used for inscriptions intended to last forever, and these on the tomb of Nefertari, queen of Pharaoh Ramses II, appear new after more than 3,250 years. It is important to remember that hieroglyphs weren't like everyday writing, like people, scribes and stuff weren't writing notes in hieroglyphs, it was only for religious purposes. Let's see what we've got over in Egypt. 600 BCE to 100 CE. Well, this isn't Egypt. That's Egypt. <laughs> Ancient Ethiopic, or Ge Gez, evolves as an offshoot of South Arabia. Up here in Saba, 900 BCE, um, alphabetic writing spread south to become the ancient South Arabian script centuries before Arabic. What else? Oop. Now let's go to Egypt. You can see some hieroglyphs here. 2050 BCE, by the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. Some hieroglyphs have come to denote sounds such as M, B, and A. Ah. Alright, let's head over into Africa. Or, I thought it was Africa, it's actually Europe. <laughs> the writings in Africa, they're pointing to Europe. 1750 BCE, the Minoans of Crete write in their own version of hieroglyphs, but also use an as yet undeciphered script called Linear A. And then up in here in 700 BCE, the Etruscans of northern Italy, borrowing from the Phoenicians and Greeks, develop their own alphabetic script. Let's see what's happening up here in 200 to 300 CE. Runes, alphabetic scripts made up of straight lines, develop in northern Germany and Scandinavia. Let's go to Mycenae in 1600 BCE. The earliest known writing in Greek is the Linear B script of the Mycenaeans. And over here in Phoenicia, you can see some phonetic alphabet here, in 1050 BCE, the Phoenician alphabet contains 22 symbols denoting only consonants. These three are equivalent to the Roman B, H, and S. Okay, maybe I got it backwards with the vowels and consonants, but moving on. <laughs> Over here in 3400 BC, you go way back in time, pictographs in Sumer in southern Mesopotamia represent the earliest known writing. We can see some very old scripts here, pretty cool. They kind of look like very poorly drawn hieroglyphs. <laughs> Doing the best they can back then. Um, actually up here, it's 1700 to 1500 BCE, Proto-Canaanite, the earliest known alphabet, is thought to have traveled from the Nile Delta or Sinai Peninsula to the Levant. And let's see, oh, over here. 200 CE. Arabic script develops in the early centuries CE and may have evolved from the script of the Nabataeans, who built the city of Petra in what's now Jordan. I did not know that the Nabataeans may have invented Arabic. That's incredible. <laughs> what amazing peoples they were. 2600 to 1800 BCE. The origin and subsequent disappearance of the Indus Valley script are both mysterious, and its intricate symbols are not yet understood. You can see some there. Again, they kind of looks like a fish, it looks like a man, it looks like a moth, right? Or a dragonfly. Pretty neat. 
let's see, in 250 BCE, a Brahmi script, possibly influenced by the syllabic or alphabetic scripts from the West, is used in India. Way right over here, in 1200 BCE, the earliest known Chinese writing is inscribed on oracle bones by fortune tellers. You can see there. Looks nothing like any Chinese script we know today. Over here, in 1 to 500 CE, Korean scribes try different methods of adapting Chinese characters to write their language. And in Nara, in 650 to 800. CE, Japanese scholars create scripts based on both classical and adapted Chinese characters. Right. Let's learn more about the Minoans and Mycenaeans. Let's see, number one is down here. Minoan palaces circa 1900 to 1450 BCE. These complex buildings, the largest of which was at Gnosis, seem to have combined the roles of palace, administrative center, warehouse, and shrine. Constructed of several stories supported by wooden tapering columns, they were adorned with wall paintings. Some rooms, decorated with bulls' horns and featuring altar-like structures, almost certainly had some ceremonial use. And no one's loved their bowls. So let's look over here on Crete. You can see Gnosis there, and various other temples over here. And these dots are other Minoan sites. You can see some up here too. Oop, and over here as well. Pretty neat how far they spread. I thought they kind of just stuck to the island, but they went out a little bit further. Next we have Minoan trade and expansion. Let's read about it. <laughs> circa 1900 to 1450 BCE. The Minoans traded widely, visiting other Greek islands and settling on Rhodes, Thera, which is modern Santorini, Melos, and Cythera. They traded with Cyprus, Egypt, and Syria, importing metals such as copper, tin, and gold, as well as ivory, and their influence spread as far as the Levant. The palace site of Zakros was probably a center for trade. So we can see their import routes are in that kind of olive green color way out to Sardinia. Um, oh no, in from Sardinia, sorry, import. Imports are coming in from Sardinia, Egypt, it says gold and alabaster from Egypt, copper from Sardinia copper to Crete. Okay, kind of confusing, but I guess. <laughs> and then the exports are in the dark green, so olive oil and pottery to Egypt, olive oil and cloth to Tyre. What else? It says pottery to Italy. <laughs> it reminds me, did anyone else play Caesar 3, or I guess the other Caesar games? It was like SimCity, but ancient Rome. And trade was like a huge part of it. Like if you didn't trade, your city would collapse. So <laughs> I always traded olive oil because it was, oh, olives always grew. <laughs> There's never a problem growing olives. Let's see. <clears throat> and then we have the decline of Minoan civilization from circa 1640 to 1450 BCE. The reason for the decline of Minoan culture is unknown, but it may be connected to the eruption of the volcano on Thera in the middle of the 2nd millennium BCE. This destroyed the Minoan settlement of Akrotiri and may have disrupted the Minoan economy, allowing the Mycenaeans to take Minoan trade routes and settlements, becoming the dominant power in the area. So we can see this volcano doing a big boom here and disrupting everything. What happens next? Next is the Mycenaean settlements. Let's slide this down. From circa 1600 to 1100 BCE. The Mycenaeans built their houses from a mixture of stone and mud brick. Clay tiled roofs were used at some sites. Their settlements were spread over much of Greece, but concentrated near the major palace sites such as Tyrans, Pylos, and Mycenae itself. 
the larger settlements acted as commercial and administrative centers and housed officials who were responsible to the palace. So, major mice name palaces you can see over here, kind of all throughout the Greek mainland here, and other different sites are even more spread out across the Greek peninsula even up here in Troy. Let's read about it. Number five, Homer's Troy, circa 1300 to 1190 BCE. Homer's epic poem, The Iliad, identifies Mycenae as the home of the legendary Greek warrior Agamemnon, hero of the war against Troy. His Sarlik, near the Aegean coast of Turkey, is the probable site of Troy. Archaeologists there have discovered evidence of a major battle dating to the Late Bronze Age, but it is unknown if this relates directly to the Trojan War described by Homer. Yeah, like a hundred years ago, they assumed that Troy wasn't real and the Iliad was fiction, but now there's a lot more evidence proving that it was quite possibly based on true events. We have Mycenaean trade from 1450 to 1100 BCE. The wealth of finds from Mycenaean settlements and graves indicates the kind of items traded by the people of the Greek Bronze Age. Raw materials such as copper and tin crossed the region by land and sea and were used in ornate Mycenaean metal. Archaeologists have also found numerous pottery storage jars, which were used to transport wine and oil. Though the imports are in the pink, let's see them way down here. So we have gold and alabaster from Egypt, ivory from Syria, copper from Sardinia, boop, boop. <laughs> and then the exports are in the purple. So we have pottery to Sicily, Italy, and Sardinia. We've got pottery to Anatolia. And pottery to the Levant and Egypt. What's up there? To the Balkans? Um, that says to the Balkans? Yeah, they traded to the Balkans. Check that out. They went way far north. Way far north than I thought they would. And then the purple lines here are the major routes in the Mycenaean heartland. So these were essentially like roads before roads were invented, right? Different paths up to the Balkans. I didn't know they went that far. That's so cool. They really spread out here. That's so neat. Let's read all the little, all the little things on here so we can learn some more. Got it right here. 1400 to 1200 BCE, the fortified Mycenaean settlement of Tiryns reached its height, as mentioned by Homer in the Iliad. Here in Thebes, circa 1200 BCE, the magnificent Mycenaean palace, or Cadmion, at Thebes, is destroyed by fire. Now, don't get confused about Thebes in Greece and Thebes in Egypt. Um, from what I understand, the Egyptians did not call Thebes Thebes, but the Greeks called Thebes Thebes. <laughs> that makes sense. So a lot of Greek names from Egypt, including the word Egypt, have survived, but most of the actual words the Egyptians used have not. So that's why there's a lot of Greek-sounding names down there in Egypt, because we only know them by their Greek names. But moving on. We have here in Athens in the 14th century BCE, Mycenaean rulers fortify the Acropolis in Athens, now the site of celebrated classical ruins. In the 16th century BCE, Minoan culture influences the early Bronze Age settlement of Philacope on the island of Melos. Here in the latest 16th century BCE. Make sure you can see. Minoans probably established a colony at Miletus. Frescoes and pottery in the Minoan style suggests their presence. And it's circa 1627 BCE, the pharaoh volcano erupts, covering the Minoan settlement of Akrotiri in Ash, and preserving outstanding frescoes and other works 
of art. Let's look over here and circa 12,000, 12,000, 2,000 BCE, Cretan settlers arrive on Cythera. The Minoan colony prospers until about 1400 BCE. Down here in Crete, circa 1900 to 1700 BCE, a palace complex, a palace complex is begun at Phaestos. It becomes one of the largest known sites on Crete. And up here, circa 1800 BCE, sized on both north, south, and east, west routes on Crete, Gornia becomes a major known trading center. How cool. Did I get them all? I think so. So interesting. I didn't know a lot of these details about the Minoans and Mycenaeans, but I do know that they loved their bulls. The bull's head vessel. This ceremonial vessel from circa 1400 BCE was found in the palace of Gnosis. The Minoans venerated the bull, considering it a symbol of man's dominion over nature. We're going to look at one more map tonight, and that is of Bronze Age China. First of all, I gotta look at this guy. This is the cutest little thing. It's so sweet. Shang bronze work. This owl-shaped vessel exemplifies the exquisite patterns in which Shang metalworkers decorated their products. These include a tableware such as food or drinking vessels. It reminds me of Bubo from, what was it, Clash of the Titans? <laughs> the little owl there. It's so cute. But let's read more about what was going on in this area back in the day before the Shang circa 2070 to 1600 BCE. A series of Neolithic cultures predate the Shang in China. Archaeologists have, for example, revealed the remains of the Longshan culture in the Yellow River Valley and the Yuxi culture in the Shandong region. Other sites, such as Early Tu, with its impressive buildings, tombs, and paved roads, point to more sophisticated cultures such as the Xia dynasty, were thought to have existed from 2070 BCE. So we don't know if the Xia actually existed. They're kind of mythological. It's kind of like a King Arthur kind of thing. Like it probably existed to some extent, but not as grand as the old stories say. It's possible the capital was right here. I don't like this blue color they used. It looks like water. It looks like they're in a giant lake, but that's still there. So it's possibly here. The Longshan culture was this area here. And the Yeshi culture is in the green, which you can see over here. This area here, really, they almost met, but they did not exist at the same time, so they didn't actually meet. Let's see what's next. I like reading about ancient, ancient, ancient China before everything, right? About the, um, the Longshan and Xiao. Shang territories, circa 1600 to 1050 BCE. From about 1600 BCE, the Shang moved southward from their heartlands in the Yellow River Valley to control a large part of northern China. They forced some areas to become vassal states granting these territories to family members, ministers, or tribal leaders. In return, the vassal rulers had to help defend the empire from nearby hostile states, pay taxes, and provide laborers to work on royal agricultural lands. Whose dog is barking at six in the morning? I don't know. Oh, it's not six in the morning. The sun is up. <laughs> How long have I been recording? How long is this video? It's 49 minutes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's about seven. Moving on. It's very late, right? So all this blue that looks like water that I don't I don't like this color on this map. It looks like water. <laughs> but this was the Shang territory. The vassal states are here in orange. They kinda look like you know what? Speaking of water, all these little dots and then these they all look like water stains. <laughs> That's funny. But um, interesting to denote the different areas and the hostile states for Niello. So these areas over here, up here, 
over here and then down even in here in their territory what's the stories of all the hostile states that were in the Shang territory that's interesting they all have their own names Kalrog Rui Hui interesting um, what's next? Shang crafts and fortifications circa 1600 to 1050 BC Archaeologists have uncovered large Shang fortifications made of rammed earth. These structures suggest that the region was strategically important for the Shang. Early Gong may have been an early Shang capital. Other finds there include the workshops of potters, bone workers who made items from bone, obviously, and bronze workers. Shang cast bronzes are among the most impressive of early Chinese objects. So it's believed the Shang capital was here at Luoyang. I mean, good spot because it's kind of right in the middle of their territory, right? You can see the Yellow River's right there, too. The major Shang bronze artifacts have been found here, and here, and up here. Very cool. I wonder if they're, yeah, Shang bronze work stuff like the little bubo there. It's next to Shang military power, circa 1400 to 1046 BCE. The Shang rulers were faced with competition for power in both the east and northwest of their Yellow River heartlands. They had a small standing force equipped with chariots and archers based at Yin, which is modern Anyang, their capital from circa 1400 BCE. They supplemented this with thousands of additional troops and weapons supplied by vassal rulers. A Shang king could therefore assemble an army of perhaps 13,000 men armed with weapons such as dagger axes that could usually subdue hostile states or rebels. Very strong military power. That's where their capital was. And, oh, that's it. What a bummer. Let's read all the little things. I've learned so much from this reading tonight about ancient China and the Minoans and Mycenaeans and all the writing. This was delightful. I said it's almost over, but let's move on. The 11th century BCE, the Shang struggle for territory against the Dongyi people. This weakens the Shang, it's contributing to their fall to the Zhao dynasty. Dear. What's happening down here? What is this? This big area circa 11th century BCE. Settlements along the Yangtze River come under Shang influence. The river's a major artery for trade. Also, it's a trade route along the river here. Very cool. Look at all these down here that are like off the map. Look at these. To the 4th century BCE, the Wu people lived to the southeast of the main area of Shang power. The Wu later became an important state under the Zhao. Over here, in circa 1200 BCE, the Shang occupies a site at Xing'an, also known as Daiyang Jiao. Archaeological finds there include hundreds of jade and bronze artifacts, indicating a highly developed culture. Then down here to the 4th century BCE, the Yue people occupy the area to the south of the Shang lands. Over here, in circa 1600 BCE, the city of San Shidui is founded. Trapezoidal in shape, it has thick enclosing walls. Wow. Here's another trade route going down here in the 3rd millennium BCE. A western trade route links China with Central Asia. It is a forerunner of the Silk Road between Eastern and Western Asia. Fascinating. Oh, I think that's all the little boxes to read. <laughs> How interesting. So, let's take a peek at what the next map is going to be in the next video. It's going to be about the Levant. So cool. But we're going to stop there or else I could go all day. <laughs> this video will be 20 hours long. Not that you guys would care. I'm sure you'd love it. But we have to stop at some point. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. I know I did. <laughs> Consider subscribing if you liked this video because I'm going to do a lot more things out of this book. 
Thank you so much for watching. I hope I already said that part. <laughs> I hope you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good.